Good evening, Facebook friends, as well as YouTube friends. Uh, my name is Bruce Sunpai Barnes. I'm here with Rachel Brindlin. I am very much honored to be here this evening uh, in a program that's uh, a wonderful um, look back at the cultural legacy of Ronald W. Lewis, um, who was definitely in New Orleans, Louisiana, a cultural icon from many different angles and aspects. He was a personal friend of mine, as well as so many people here in the city of New Orleans, and not just in New Orleans, but he, he projected his, his love for his culture, his love for sustaining important things in his neighborhood, um, purely from his heart out into the world, and I would say out into the greater universe. Some people are interested in following the NASA Mars uh, space project. Me, myself, very New Orleans homocentric, and we don't really look out into outer space to try and figure out what's going on with us. We kind of look right into the neighborhood and see what's, what's happening. So I'm happy to be here with this program, uh, and I'd like to send out a big thank you to Mr. Charles Lavelle, as well as Charlie, who's doing a lot of technical engineering. And we are here at the wonderful Cafe Istanbul here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, and this is a program that's part of the CARES Act, um, which is supported through the um, NEH and LEH Louisiana. And I'm here with my uh, partner here and colleague. And um, we're going to kind of uh, take a look through some of the, the wonderful things that Ronald Lewis brought to this city starting out with a PowerPoint um, and, and taking a look at, I don't want to steal all of the, I could say so much, uh, but I'm going to uh, play a different role today and not talk my head off, <laughs> but um, allow Rachel to uh, speak about um, some of the wonderful work that she has done and others have done in uh, great collaborative efforts uh, with Ronald Lewis. I have my own as well. And I'd like to say uh, a big good evening and hello and a shout out to uh, all of Ronald's family members as well. Many, Rashad, everybody. Bebel's where you at? Um, and all of his, his family also. And so many people that he's touched and been a part of here in New Orleans. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel and uh, let her have the first half of this okay uh, well good evening everybody thanks so much for joining us virtually it would be wonderful if we could be together hopefully we'll be together again soon and yeah thanks very much Charles for bringing us together this is part of a for the first of four um, series that the New Orleans Healing Center is organizing um, the next one will be on May 13th it's called losing home um, the price of climate change in Louisiana um, it will be at 6 p.m. as well. So if you like this one, circle back around for the second one. Um, and yes, hello to uh, Minnie and Rashad and Ronaldo and every, the whole family. I um, also want to say, you know, hello to the Choctaw Hunters, the Big Nine Social and Pleasure Club, Helen Regis and LJ Goldstein for welcoming me into the family of the House of Dance and Feathers many years ago. Thanks very much, Bruce, for being here with me. Um, <laughs> um, for those of y'all are not familiar with the Neighborhood Story Project, um, we're a collaborative bookmaking organization that's based out of the, um, the Seventh Ward of New Orleans and is in a partnership with the University of New Orleans and UNO Press. Um, and <coughs> over a decade ago, Ronald and I created a book together that I brought with the to show you all this evening. It's called The House of Dance and Feathers, a museum by Ronald W. Lewis. Um, in the last uh, 10 years, oh, in the last 10 years um, since we published it in, well, I guess it's been almost 12 years, in 2009 it came out. Um, it's gone through four printings and sold over 10,000 copies. Um, it was one of the main ways that Ronald um, supported the museum in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. Um, and uh, so I prepared this talk this evening um, for people who may have never heard of Ronald before, as well as people who are very close to him. I hope I've 
been able to do a, a good balance of it. Um, I'm also going to quote Ronald quite a bit because um, he uh, was a, a wonderful orator. We were just talking the other day about how, <laughs> or Minnie was saying, any kind of event there was, Ronald was going to make a speech. He definitely would be here making a speech. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he really, um, throughout our working relationship together, I rarely spoke about our book project. Ronald was the one who did that. Um, he's the one who was the spokesperson for his museum and for uh, many different aspects of his community in the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, and so I, I want to incorporate him into what we were discussing today. Um, uh, the, the first slide that you're seeing here is Ronald um, with his um, and his wife Charlotte, who we call Minnie, and um, two s photographs of the backyard of Tupelo Street in the Lower Ninth Ward. The first one is many years ago when they were raising their kids and the backyard was full of neighborhood children and um, sports and all kinds of fun activities for, for young people. Um, and the second one is one of the first gatherings of the House of Dance and Feathers, which was a, a collaborative museum project that he created uh, starting in 2003 and incorporating right before Katrina in 2005. He said, um, when I first asked him about the House of Dance and Feathers, when you see there's something missing from your community, you want to contribute to make it whole. I thought that cultural education was the missing part of the Lower Ninth Ward, and I've worked to create a museum to fill in this blank. Um, he, Ronald didn't have a lot of early photographs of his life. He um, started really documenting his uh, community when he started having children, and um, he shared a lot of his photo albums with me from that time. Um, but I wanted to ask him while we were working on our book about um, what some of his early influences were around being a cultural educator. And he said, I was growing up in a time of transition from the time when our parents and grandparents were being beaten and bit by dogs fighting for the civil rights to the Black Panthers and them saying, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. He went on to say, I'm a sympathizer. I was a sympathizer. I wore dashikis and black berets on my head bootlace bracelets from fellows who had been in Vietnam. I saw Black Panther newspapers on Canal Street and knew some of the Black Panthers who worked in the Desire Projects personally. They used to have the Nation of Islam down in the Lower Ninth Ward, and I used to go to the mosque and get some of the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, as well as the Pan-African thinking of the Black Crusaders Incorporated. I was just out there soaking up education that is still part of my self-identity today. So. It was a part of Black Lives Matter many, many years ago. <laughs> uh, yes, you know, but he was also very happy to uh, tell you about how well things were engaged in his neighborhood in the Lower Ninth Ward and, and, and just how much it, it meant and was important around organizing, just being able to organize in neighborhoods. Um, yeah, those were tremendous skill sets that he had. Yeah. Uh, and he was a diplomat. <laughs> He was a diplomat and a lot of that came from um, his work as a union organizer. He worked for over 30 years for the Regional Transit Authority, working on the streetcar lines. He worked on streetcar lines on St. Charles and Avenue and saw a lot of the wealth inequality that was going on in the city firsthand. Um, in 1977, he organized the local chapter of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. and. Um, did a lot of union negotiating. Um, what he told me about that time was, being a union organizing rep taught me a lot about public speaking. I've learned how to document and put things in the right place because you're dealing with people's livelihoods. Mm -hmm. I think that that is one of the things that um, really carried over throughout his life in other aspects too, just about fairness, about following through and saying, you know, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be there for you long-term relationships, um, and he, it definitely played out in his relationship with the Neighborhood Story Project, really seeing um, the NSP as one of his partners um, around business, <laughs> um, 
around you know cultural production and things like that. Um, when he retired, when he was 50 years old, he had worked for 30 years. He started when he was 20. And he said, I walked out the door and I never looked back. I started building a new life and concentrating on the House of Dance and Feathers. Um, and one of the first places he went to when he didn't have a nine to five job where he was having to be somewhere and at the same time, same place every day was um, a, an important spot in Treme called the Backstreet Cultural Museum that was run by um, Sylvester Francis. Bruce is a very close friend of yours. Do you want to say anything about the Backstreet? Well, sure. You know, the Backstreet was a, uh, a wonderful place that was a collective of, it was just a meeting ground, a place where people would come and sit on the porch. Uh, people like Ronald Lewis, who had uh, worked a long, hard day, and for example, on uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, people loved to sit on that front porch and talk about what was going on with them culturally, and they would um, uh, share and pass information. So the folks that uh, Ronald and myself would sit in, I was actually going over there because I was working for the National Park Service at the time, and I'd taken on a new role working in the city, something very different than what I'd done before. But I knew that if I was going to, as a park ranger, be a part of that, I would need to engage myself in actually uh, the deep culture of the city. Some of the first people I ran into, uh, I knew Sylvester already, but Ronald, uh, I, I met him uh, perhaps a, a year or so before, and I'd seen him at like Indian practices and things, but getting a chance to sit down with him uh, at the back street and with uh, Sylvester, with uh, Ray Blasio, the guy they call Big Chief Hatchet, uh, uh, Tootie Montana, you name it, all those folks would come and sort of hang out there because it was just a wonderful place. And then, you know, it became a museum itself uh, in, in short order. And, and Ronald was, um, he was really into that. He could see in a very deep way, the value system of people collectively coming together that were the creators of the culture and how they, you know, just how they greeted each other and spoke with, with every, everyone that was their peers. And that was one of the beautiful things about him was how he could level off with you about being a part of, um, uh, you know, a community in this city and, and not just through one angle, but through all of those vast uh, different complex um, differences that created the city itself. And he understood them all very well. And he was friends with and, and uh, was respected by and knew everybody, <laughs> uh, as, as well as Sylvester Fans, the same thing. So they were, you know, that was a, a great combination to have those two gentlemen uh, in the same place. It was uh, some of the reasons that I thought, um, you know, I think I'll go to school here right now, and uh, if I can find this later on in life somewhere in the university system, I'll check it out, but I believe I'm at school. And I think I, I still believe that very deeply. That was, uh, you know, something you couldn't buy, you couldn't sell it, you couldn't give it away. It, you just had to be there in it, and, you know, being in their presence is, was always that way. Yeah. Um, when I asked Ronald about what his experience was like at the back street, he said, I really credit Sylvester for having a place we could call our own. Um, we have very few in our culture who brought it to this level. As I was nearing my retirement, I started going by the back street and hanging out. Sylvester opened the door for me. Sometimes when he would have a big tour, I would do the story about the social and pleasure clubs. He entrusted his livelihood to me. If you're ever around us, you'll hear me call him boss man because he was boss to me. And again, this idea of entrusting livelihood, entrusting resources, entrusting, um, you know, stories as, um, you know, a, a kind of tr way of, of building um, relationships with one another and um, was key for Ronald and also for Sylvester. Um, 
the the museum became official in 2005. Ronald likes to say that um, he had been accumulating a lot of regalia from um, his participation with Mardi Gras Indians and social and pleasure clubs. And Minnie was like, you know what? I'm tired of this. Take it outside. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this was, you know, part of his imagination around, okay, well, what could I do with this space? The back street provided a um, a roadmap of turning it into a cultural education center. And his great friend, Robert Starks, who became the business manager of the Big Nine um, earlier with him, uh, helped him do his paperwork. This is a photograph of the um, early museum that he had right before Katrina. And this is a photograph that uh, Helen Regis took of... Um, what happened after Katrina. Um, for those of y'all who are tuning in <laughs> other places um, and maybe didn't follow Hurricane Katrina, um, the Lower Ninth Ward was extremely devastated by a breach in the industrial canal levee and um, many parts of the community were completely leveled. Um, Ronald and many um, stayed in the city in a hotel f during the storm and then they relocated to a shelter in um, Thibodeau. And Ronald made a scrapbook of his time there. Um, and this is a page from it, where he's calling out um, Hurricane Betsy in 1965 and how he survived that, and then how he survived in 2005 as well. Um, he actually did a, a very large documentary project at the um, at the um, shelter, photographing people and their belongings. And um, it's a really important part of the House of Dance and Feathers collection. Um, because their house was a little bit further away from the industrial canal, it didn't get knocked over by the avalanche of water. But you can see that it had a, a huge amount of damage and the little museum that was in the back and the little white building um, was, um, you know, every, a lot of the things that were left there were completely flooded out. He took a lot of his scrapbooks and his photographs with him um, when he left, so some things were able to be preserved. But this is an, an old um, flag from the Big Nine. I became um, aware of the House of Dance and Feathers um, in the rebuilding year after Katrina. I, I participated in a, organ, um, a conference that Bruce was at too called Reinhabiting NOLA that brought together cultural organizations, architects, urban planners, environmentalists to kind of reimagine what the city was like, going to be like when we put all of our love and care into rebuilding. Um, and I was introduced to Ronald through uh, his good friend, Helen Regis. I'll show you a photo of her as a baby doll on the right with uh, Miriam Batiste uh, on the left. Um, Helen is a cultural anthropologist at LSU. And um, for years, Ronald worked with her on writing projects about social and pleasure clubs. And she had invited him to come to the program, uh, to this like day long retreat that we were doing um, at that event, he said, you know, I need help. If there's a bunch of architects here that are interested in helping rebuild, I need, you know, I would like to rebuild my museum as a way to support my neighborhood. And um, word started spreading that there was a small museum that needed help in the Lower Ninth Ward, and a group of um, architects pulled together to start to work on that. The Tulane City Center was a part of it, um, but the core group was a group of students from Kansas State University. Mm. Here they are, <laughs> um, some of them. There's a whole group of them, and they came and lived in New Orleans and helped Ronald and Minnie not only rebuild the um, museum, but their house. And um, it was one of the first things going on in the Lower Ninth Ward at that time. Is There's this in 2006 or five? <clears throat> I would say it's like the beginning of 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and it, but maybe even before, because they were coming and um, checking it out and 
seeing what was going on. And it became this place uh, as the rebuilding was happening where everybody was stopping by. Tons of media um, from all over the world, neighbors, um, you know, s relief organizations that were setting up shop. And, and Ronald's museum became this place where he, uh, the recreation of the museum became this place that was orientating people. Yeah, I, I remember uh, <laughs> he invited me to come down and see the progress of what they had started doing. And um, he said, you got you to come down here and see what we're doing down here. And when I got there, there was uh, probably 25 or 30 students there working and they were just taking a lunch break and there was another whole, like a busload of them showed up. And um, I'm not for certain, but I believe not long after this, they started doing tours of the Lower Ninth Ward. And, you know, the House of Dancing Feathers was a part of that tour that people were sort of coming to find because there weren't very many places that you could actually go and talk to someone. It was mostly like some of the earlier photographs you saw, and it was just a, a slab or the steps left from a, uh, a house that once was there. But, you know, he, he was in there, and, uh, you know, it was constant media action and, and people stopping by with students. To, and he was a, an information hub, just so much like the back street that I'd spoken about earlier, but sort of on a different scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely, uh, you know moving outward into the world in a large way. Yeah, and here you see a photograph of him getting interviewed by Steve Inskeep. Steve Inskeep continually checked in with him for years. Um, a l after um, a little while, the New Yorker was reporting through Dan Baum's columns, and um, Ronald was one of his... I'm sorry, who is, who is Steve Inskeep? Steve, Steve Inskeep is a reporter for NPR. Okay. Um, and um, I'm not sure what his program is. Maybe it's All Things Considered. Um, and Stan Baum went on to write Nine Lives and have Ronald become one of the main characters in that book. Um, this is a photo of the museum when it was first rebuilt. It looks very different. <laughs> it has an architectural style to it. Um, and this is a photo of... Ronald giving an early tour in the museum. Nothing was labeled in the museum. Everything was interpreted through Ronald telling stories. Mm -hmm. And he knew uh, everything very deeply. So in the second part of the talk, I'd like to just share s some of how he uh, interpreted his museum. Um, Here's a installation. A lot of installations were like shrines or uh, assemblages. Um, and this one he dedicated to Pan-Africanism. And I asked him to explain what he usually says in a uh, tour. To, and he said, I decided to use boats and masks and figurines to show connections across places. The masks represent West African culture and the boats represent those slave ships. And in the middle, I put an Aunt Jemima doll with its image of racism. It's easy to just push history to the side, but I don't want to do that because it's all there. When I talk about my mama coming off the sugar cane plantation, I'm not ashamed of that because that's where my roots are. As I'm growing up, my mama always had her hair tied up in a scarf. When I see this doll, I remember that too and think about how my family survived those cane fields. So while the House of Dance and Feathers had, um, you know, a name that evoked joy, he was not shy about um, sharing the hard realities of structural racism in America. Um, he, he believed that it was an important part of the, the mission of the House of Dance and Feathers to talk about black cultural arts and autonomy and self, um, um, you know, like, having something of your own and on your own terms. He also um, had a, a great love of the musical lineages that came out of the Lower Ninth Ward. His 
Um, wife's family is the part of the Hill family, um, which is a, a large musical family in the city. And he often felt like the Lower Ninth Ward story around music was a bit neglected compared to other parts of the city. And so this is a whole um, collage that he created about musicians from the area. Um, Bruce, did you want to say anything about music and um, the Lower Nine? Well, I mean, I would say it was a treasure trove <laughs> of people that came out of the the Lower Ninth Ward um, many years ago. You know, I I spent a lot of time there. One of my favorite guitar players that I'd met when I first moved into the city in the 80s was uh, Boogie Bill Webb. <laughs> he lived uh, at Tupelo and Airport down in that, that area there. So I hung out there and not far from him, of course, was uh, on Coffin Avenue was Fats Domino and uh, Oliver Morgan and there was musicians and little small saloons like you wouldn't normally see and think of in New Orleans for they they just look like they were 30 or 40 years previous to what you found in the as soon as you cross railroad tracks um, you know headed west it, it was a different change going from the seventh ward to the ninth ward even but the lower nine in particular um, you could find just straight up saloons that were somewhere between a, a western movie and uh, you know something that you would see in the uh, upper parts of the delta but uh, that neighborhood that Ronald uh, was in was was always one of the deepest for people and little farms everywhere uh, you know you could go there and folks had uh, ponies and goats and lots of chickens and things like that that they were raising because it's down in the back side of uh, you know where things were happening uh, so of course this was uh, Ronald's uh, folks, he was friends with all of them, and and he was happy to, you know, to speak about that wealth of uh, folk, uh, people that were there. That you know, uh, it's true that they were often forgotten. So, in terms of what they were doing there, and and uh, you know, the lure is to have people come up into the core part of the city, but that was certainly its own core. Yeah, a, a lot of people from the country moved to the Lower Ninth Ward in the, um, the turn of the century. Um, Ronald's family came from, like he was saying earlier, sugarcane plantations. Um, there was um, also a lot, a lot of um, white working class families that lived in the area before desegregation. And yeah, many of them moved to um, Chalmette and other parts of St. Bernard Parish afterwards with the waves of white flight. And Ronald remembered it being more integrated. Um, besides the exhibits that he curated, one of the things that um, was similar about the House of Dance and Feathers and the back street is that people donated a lot of objects that were of importance to them. And um, this was how he rebuilt his collection after so much of it had been washed away in the storm. I just wanted to share the story of Daryl Keyes, um, who's a member of the Ch Comanche Hunters, which was a Mardi Gras Indian tribe in the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, he donated this pair of shoes after the first year of Carnival, and he told us a story about it. The Comanche Hunters were the first gang from the Lower Nine to mask after Katrina. It was just me and my two cousins, Vernon Freeman and Jonathan Moulton, as well as two little queens. They were living in FEMA trailers, and I had rented a house in the Seventh Ward. We said, we're going to all chip in and do it. Most people weren't going to mask or come back for Carnival because they had lost their homes. Why mask? I decided to do it for the people. While everyone was in Texas and all over the world, I was sitting at home sewing. A lot of my patches, brooches, and materials were in my attic and never got wet from the storm. But they were dirty. When I saw the patch on my old boots, I felt that I wanted to make a new pair. But then I said, no, I'm going to let people see the dirt. They survived the storm. The original boots were blue, but I took off the patches and chose red material for the people who had died in the storm. The day we paraded, we went back to, into the lower nine. I said a prayer by the barge that broke through the levee, and then we started walking up Claiborne to the St. Claude Bridge, singing two songs that we made up, Busted Levee and How You Gonna Cross the Water. 
That day, I walked through the Ninth Ward across the bridge. I felt like nothing could stop me. If Katrina couldn't stop these shoes, nothing could. I wanted to donate them. A patch is something on your body, but these shoes, walking through the Ninth Ward, means a lot. I told Mr. Ronald never to clean them because you'll take the royalty out of it. These are straight off the land. Here's a picture of Vernon coming over to show Ronald some of the patches that he was working on. It's a wonderful photo. And so these are, uh, is that some of the first things that someone brought to him uh, uh, after that time period there in the, in the beginning of uh, sort of the recovery of... The shoes? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He donated mm -hmm. these shoes to the um, museum. And it was, uh, these are the kinds of stories that you would hear Ronald tell when you went to the museum. You know, he'd say, check out these shoes, and then he would tell Daryl's story. Mm -hmm. Or he just like um, on a regular day, others would just pass by. Vernon's not donating these necessarily to the museum. He's just coming by to show Ronald how he's doing on his patches. Um, because Ronald was um, one of the founders of um, Mardi Gras Indian tribe called the Choctaw Hunters, mm -hmm. um, it was an, um, an organization that began in the early 90s. Um, and he, part of the museum was dedicated to telling these kind of more deeper stories of how traditions are tied to friendships and, and networks. He said, one of the greatest things I, got to, I learned from Mardi Gras Indian culture was to get to know a person outside of that costume, get to know him as an individual. When you see a photo of mine, I usually know the stories behind the suits. It's the same with the people in the parade photos. I could tell you about each club. Over the years, I wanted to know the people, not just the parade, the organizations, who was the president. We got to know each other on a personal basis. And that's how I try to run my museum too. I get to know the photographers and the people in the um, pictures. So Ronald uh, masked as a second spy boy for the Seminoles in 1990 with Edgar Jacobs, who had been raised in the Seventh Ward and was part of the network of tambourine and fan that Jerome Smith and Rudy Lombard started um, as a black cultural arts organization that's been so powerful in its legacy throughout the city. Um, and after they had that experience together, Ronald told Edgar, uh, I may, I'll make you an offer. If you become a big chief down in the lower ninth ward, I would provide the gang. So R Edgar had just moved down there, and he thought that that would be a, a way of to, to pull the community together. So here's a snapshot um, from 92, where you can see Ronald with a tambourine on the left, and Peter Alexander was the second chief who was one of Ronald's best friends from growing up. Uh, Ricky Getridge, who uh, masses spy boy with the yellow Pocahontas, was also part of the tribe and helped sew. So this is, uh, he was actually the person who taught Ronald how to sew. Yeah, and he's, yeah, he's a great sewer and he- Great he, singer. Yeah, he was a full on Indian and he masked for years with the yellow Pocahontas, as you say, and uh, yeah, Ricky would teach anybody how to, if you could listen. Uh, he tried to teach me, but I didn't listen well enough, <laughs> I must say. Um, but, it, yeah, that's a, that, that just shows um, one of the many aspects, I guess you would say. And I know you worked with Ronald for a long time, but around his organizing skills and how well he could just bring a, a group of people together. Men, women, children does not make a difference. He loved and enjoyed uh, I think uh, bringing people together for some common good, and that was like uh, some of the best of the things that you could see. And I guess this gives, um, you know, a credit and a nod back to his days as a union organizer. But he would bring odd groups of people together to create something all the time, um, and even outside of like Indian culture and things like that. Um, um, you know, he he definitely had that skill set to to engage people with a twinkle in his eye if you saw him with with the twinkle in his eye 
you're about to get it. <laughs> you, you're going to get some full-on <laughs> Ronald Lewis, and he was going to hook you whether you wanted to be hooked or not. Uh, you just pay attention. It's coming. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> he did it all the time, which was like, to me, I suppose it was one of the, the main reasons that he was such a perfect museum director and creator, you know, in that, in that concept uh, was just that the ability to engage people with his stories and animate uh, objects that he had there. I believe it was like, you know, such a wonderful gift. And, uh, and it's why, you know, people from universities and students of all walks of life, not just universities, but, but people who were just like students in life uh, were so, uh, you know, enthralled by being there and visiting that place with him, um, telling, uh, you know, what the objects are and, and what they meant. And it's very, seems very apropos that he would have the place set up where there were no names and labels on things <laughs> because he was going to, um, you know, create that scenario. Yeah, so in this case, in this um, slide that y'all are looking at now, you see an actual patch that was on display at the museum, and you see a photograph that was taken by Jeffrey David Ehrenreich, who was a, um, a colleague of mine in the anthropology department. A photographer started to donate to the museum because they saw it as a way of repatriating their images back to the community that um, they were representing. Um, another great friend of Ronald's in the Lower Ninth Ward is little Walter Cook from the Creole Wild West. He, that tribe is known to be uptown, but little Walter actually lives in the Lower Ninth Ward and helped uh, Ronald sew. And f for a number of years, Ronald created beautiful suits for his son Rashad. Um, so this is the two of them together. And a lot of that same network that started the Choctaw Hunters went on to start um, the Big Nine Social and Pleasure Club. He says, many of the same people came together. We were such a creative group of people that, uh, that the parade became another outlet to burn off some of that energy. When a person says the Treme, they're evoking a history of cultural identity in New Orleans. For the Lower Nine, we were just known as the Ninth Ward, as fearless people. Many people have lived in the city and never crossed the bridge over the Industrial Canal. When social and pleasure clubs began in our neighborhood, they brought hundreds and hundreds of people to this community to see parades in the Ninth Ward. So this is really important for him to just share all of these different layers of the neighborhood. And what year did he start the uh, Big Nine? Uh, in 1995. So this is all mm -hmm. happening. His, his network of friends um, that he did the Choctaw Hunters with come together to do the Big Nine as well. Here you see um, Big Chief Edgar Joseph parading with the Big Nine and Robert Starks, who was a, uh, a great follower of Mardi Gras Indians as well, and um, spent a, a lot of time with um, the lower, um, the Ninth Ward Hunters and also the White Eagles, um, were two of the, the key people that also helped found um, the Big Nine, as well as um, Peter Alexander, who's now the president. And here's an example of just the way that they represented their community. Have Minnie in the back <laughs> with the umbrella. And that's Ronald on the left there. Ronald is in the center. In the center, rather. Yeah. Yeah, yeah on the far left is something different. Yeah. yeah. At Ronald's Museum, he collected a lot of ephemera from parades, um, and he also used the parade as a form of media to be able to amplify the voices of his community. He was the president of the Big Nine the entire time that um, he, he was with us, um, and had just passed it on to Peter a, a year before. Um, so this is a, a part of the collection at the House of Dance and Feathers. It's a um, portrait of Kim Groves, that they used at their parade in 2004. And, and Ronald explains why she was important. Uh, Kim Groves lived around the corner. Her death was a tragedy because a person lost their life for doing the right thing. She reported police brutality and was killed for it. We martyred her for being a person who stood for the right thing and gave her life for it. Even though the powers that be who caused her death um, 
didn't think her life had any meaning, the people in our community did. After we memorialized Kim, we decided to always recognize the losses in our community, regardless of whether they paraded with the Big Nine. Um, the same year, this was a, a piece of artwork that circulated at parades that Ronald saved as well. It was a portrait of um, Joseph Shotgun Williams. Um, uh, Joe was um, Betty Ann Lasty's grandson and the nephew of Herlin Riley. Um, he was also the trumpet player for the Hottie Brass Band. And as Ronald says, it was a tragedy the way he lost his life. The police said that they had cornered him and he started ramming a police car with a truck um, he was driving. But he was boxed in. How could he ram anything when they got him bumper to bumper? And then he's getting out of the car with his hands up in the air when they killed him. Um, so this is an you know, his museum is an archive of the contemporary as well as the historical. It's, um, you know, he's protesting police brutality um, at his museum as well as uh, in the streets. Yeah, I think it's, uh, again, he, you know, he was a, a community person completely. And so, you know, having this be a part of it and, and um, to remember, not to forget about things and events that are important that uh, have happened and, and then like where's the justice in it, um, yeah. Here's a photograph of the Big Nine, the first parade after Katrina when they were able to come back together and that parade was extremely significant for the community. It was, I went to it myself and it was amazing to see a massive crowd of folks crossing that bridge, uh, coming out of Lower Ninth Ward, um, which had been, during Katrina, a symbol of uh, a lot of rough things, quite frankly, um, you know, that had happened in the, in the course of things. That one and, you know, some other bridges around the city, of course, uh, but, but just to see the outpouring of, of people and that signal that uh, the ability to sort of rise like a phoenix out of the ashes. Uh, when they had been written off, they they really did something wonderful and had the whole city and dear to um, how they pulled that off at that time, which I still don't know how they did it, but <laughs> it was a, a, a lot of people. Peter was telling us that a lot of the people didn't, um, who were doing the volunteering at the time to help rebuild, just couldn't believe that something like that was going on. Um, yeah. And I, I think the, for all the people who helped um, rebuild the museum, in gen like those specific people, they definitely did believe it was gonna happen. And it was beautiful to see them there, to see what they were working towards. You know, uh, I, it was a, a beautiful coming together of different parts of, the, the new people who are in town to support the rebuild as well as um, yes. residents who were displaced and I coming back. Taking stu yeah, there were uh, volunteers of all, from all walks of life, but lots of folks that had come to town and had been volunteering for quite a while. Uh, and all of these different organiza organizations had bright colored t-shirts, lime green, orange, blue, you name it. And uh, to be at that parade and see you know, they, had, they hadn't seen a parade, <laughs> so they didn't really know anything about it, but to, to see how it was done, and you know, the response, you know, New Orleanians and people who were uh, just so desperate to have something like that happen full on, uh, in, the, in the mix of all of the folks that were, um, had been working the whole time and were still working and still had those clothes on uh, <laughs> when, they, when they went to the parade, uh, just to see it um, and, you know, uh, there was so much uh, talk and chatter and questions that was happening uh, just among people. I even I'd taken a, a group of students out there myself that were here in, in town from uh, New England University in uh, New Hampshire, and they they just could not believe that that's what what actually went on in the city normally on Sundays, you know. Yeah, and just the idea that you can participate in the parade, yeah. that, that is kind of blows people's minds when they're not from New Orleans. Um, here's a photo of Ronald and his close friend Cosmo um, 
Gilbert Dave working on regalia for their upcoming parades and, and a number of years ago, he often made all of the um, regalia f for his division of the big nine at the museum. So they're cutting things out. You got the, par and here's an example of one other more, this was from last year, um, where again, the, the bridge <laughs> is this metaphor on so many different levels. Uh, and it says still crossing that water. Before we go into talking a little bit about some of his other cross-cultural connections and the making of the book, do you want to say anything about um, Ronald becoming the gatekeeper of the North Side Skull and Bone Gang in his retirement? Um, yes, I do. Um, as a matter of fact, that's, um, you know, that was one of, Ronald had plans and he, uh, I told you <laughs> before, when he had a twinkle in his eye, he was up to something and you were going to be involved in it, <laughs> whether you knew it or not. And that's, uh, you know, when he first decided to, that uh, he, you know, he was contemplating masking with the Skull and Bone Gang, and he hung out on the porch with Al and other folks. Um, and that was a big part of, uh, you know, his, his thought process. Um, I was actually with him when he was talking to Sylvester about, you know, he understood protocol so well. So he decided he was going to perhaps start a museum and went over to, you know, uh, tell Sylvester that he had inspired him and with his good graces that he wanted to create something in the Lower Ninth Ward, uh, which, you know, they agreed. And, and, uh, and that really even brought their friendship a lot closer together. Uh, but masking with Ronald, Ronald uh, became uh, a member of the Skull and Bone Gang, I believe, in 2003. Uh, and... Being Ronald Lewis, he knew what he wanted to do. So he didn't wait to have a, a position created for him. He created his own position. So he created the gatekeeper's position, uh, which was good. And he explained to me and Al why he was doing that. And, you know, we couldn't argue with him because he had it, he had it foolproof. <laughs> he, he said he was going to, he talked about, one of the things he talked about was having worked on uh, laying track for so long like he had, and he had some arthritis in one knee and an ankle at that time, and he was like, I can't run around and jump around like I used to, uh, so uh, I'm going to hold this place down when y'all go out and when you come back because somebody has to watch the gate and and make sure that things are correct because uh you know one of the things that we do is we always come back to the place that that we leave out of of course uh and so he created that position for himself and he was sort of an envoy and ambassador and when we would come back in the afternoon after going out early in the morning ronald would have a full-on usually a massive crowd of people there with him and uh, and we started um, going over to the newly erected Tomb of the Unknown Slaves there at St. Augustine Church. So we come back and we were like, well, we think about going around and said, wait, 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 you don't want to go now. Wait um, 30 minutes because I have the TV stations coming over there already. They're going to be there at 2.30. So if we just hold on a couple of minutes, so, you know, we'd wait, you know, he's like organized all this stuff and done that. And he was uh, showing his value and his, his ability to, um, you know, make something really good happen out of, you know, just like a little inkling of an idea that we had. We wanted to go over there and honor that. But he was like, it's going to happen like this. And, you know, when we get done with it this time, the whole world's going to know about it. And that's, you know, that's what he did. So it became one of those moments, and you can see him in this photograph right here. He's over on the far um, uh, right corner. Uh, so he, you know, he, he always had his, his own wonderful ideas about how he wanted to create things, and, um, you know, he, he made it happen. Um. It's so a nice photo of you and Sylvester and Ronald. This is from more recent times. Um, 
one of the other re relationships that was really important to Ronald was his long-term friendship with L.J. Goldstein, who was the founder of Cru de Jus, um, and also Cru de Delusion, and um, um, the Six to Nine, one of the co-founders of the Six to Nine Social and Pleasure Club. Ronald and I were actually on the advisory committee <laughs> together for the Six to Nine Social and Pleasure Club for a number of years. Um, and they really had like a, a great cross-cultural exchange yeah, about parades. That's the sixth ward to the ninth ward social yeah. and pleasure club. Yeah, it was a social and pleasure club um, dedicated to Halloween. So they passed out, we passed out candy. It was a walking parade. Mm -hmm. And Ronald and um, uh, LJ's idea was that they would kind of combine the, um, the marching cr crews of, like small walking crews that happen during carnival with the social and pleasure club aesthetics and bring something together for Halloween in the evening for the kids. And it was actually a pretty fabulous parade for many years. Um, when I asked Ronald about his relationship, well, so I guess LJ is a photographer. So a few things about LJ. He's a great photographer. He has a photograph uh, that he took of, um, Dorn Pappy Kemp, who ha ran a very famous bar that supported Second Line parades in Central City. Um, he um, w paraded with the Treme Sidewalk Steppers for a long time, and they had a, um, you know, a relationship around p parading um, that began with social and pleasure clubs. Ronald says, um, LJ started on our side of the fence and learned the discipline of how we run a social and pleasure club. He br then brought it into another world of Mardi Gras crews, and I mentored him. He showed me another world within the Jewish community, and I met some great people. And I tried to fine-tune him about our culture and history, because he's in the mode of a son to me. There's a photo of the two of them um, on the other side. And... Um, you know, so all kinds of stuff happens in New Orleans around parades. You know, we could talk about it <laughs> in the abstract, but when you bring different groups of people together and a lot of um, the, the Crew de Jew uh, parade is satirical, you know, Ronald was taking some risk of joining that parade in terms of how people were going to receive him, not people within Crew de Jew themselves but you know just the general public and he told me a story about what happened the year after Katrina when he paraded with them um, they were uh, their theme was the wandering Jews because um, of all the mass displacement that was going on um, and oftentimes the parade would directly <laughs> address racist stereotypes so um, it, in that parade everybody wore large noses and glasses and put stars of David on their back. And Ronald did that as well in solidarity. Um, he said, during the parade, I got cussed out by a white man. I looked at him in the face. He said, what are you doing with that goddamn star of David on your back? He didn't add the N word, but I felt it. I looked at him for a minute. How could I answer him? I told him, look at my nose, motherfucker. He got... <laughs> which was like a classic round line. He got infuriated and walked off down the street, hollering and screaming and cussing. I told LJ, look at me, look at the color of my skin, look at where I grew up in the deep south. Whether it's anti-Semitism or just plain old racism, I know what this is. Um, LJ's also told me that he had a chant that he did, which that he wanted me to tell y'all, which is there ain't no Jew like a Ninth Ward Jew because the Ninth Ward just got one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and every year at the museum, <laughs> sorry, at the, uh, at the museum, they, um, not every year, but Ronald has hosted a Seder and for Passover and has um, really been an important part of, of that community. Um, a number of years later, he was honored as the king of Cru de Jew. I mean, not Cru de Jew, Cru de Vue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then they went on to start the Six to Nine Social and Pleasure Club. So this is a, a few photos from that. And then this is some examples of how, um, you know, J Ronald's Jewish connections are showcased in the museum. Oi, hail, Ronald Lewis, king of Crude Boo. And um, one of LJ's photographs from an Orthodox synagogue. That's, that's <laughs> <pretty simple. laughs>
Yeah, they uh, definitely have, over all those years, had a wonderful bond. Um, what was it like for you um, creating this book or catalog uh, with Ronald Lewis and all of his, his many friends? Um, what were some of the, the uh, like some of the main things that you like take away from having worked closely with him and um, stitching into and creating a book out of all of those uh, folks that he had relationships with, you know, and, and creating books because this is probably one that was more unusual than maybe some others that you've made. You know, books don't usually have that many characters or voices in them, uh, but that book is probably got a hundred people in it that are all doing different things. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so originally I thought that we would kind of transform Ronald's photo albums and um, displays and, you know, his curation of the museum into a catalog. And we worked on that with um, me spending a lot of time over there, going through his collection with him, recording stories that he had told um, in his tours, you know, doing life history work with him, and then typing it up and editing it and bringing it back to him to see um, you know, if we were on the right track, mm -hmm. the, just in a kind of a collaborative editing mode. Um, but then as we started to pull it together, we recognized that um, we really, um, if we were value, valuing the relationships behind the images, um, that we needed to let people know that they were going to be in the book. And also that the book was going to be something that was for sale and that the use of their image would be a way to support the museum. Mm -hmm. And we thought, you know, if people wanted to bow out and <laughs> not participate in that part of it, that would be fine, but that we needed to let them know. Um, and Ronald had, um, you know, a wide network around the city. And, you know, y'all saw some of the photos that are in the book this evening, um, but there's many, many other ones. Um, and so he basically sent me out for a year to visit with all kinds of social and pleasure clubs and Mardi Gras Indians. And um, while I was there, uh, I would be showing them the photo and asking for their blessing to create this book with them. Um, mm. But then it seemed like a missed opportunity not to actually hear what was going on from their point of view in those moments. Um, and so we created kind of extended captions to go with most of the images, which are in um, other people's voices. And so like the story of the, the shoes with, from Daryl Keyes, for example, was part of that project. But um, you, you get to see a, a, like kind of firsthand experiences around the, the friendship and the um, great rivalries and um, stories of coming together that happen in um, African-American performing traditions. And it was, uh, yeah, it was wow. awesome. I, uh, I'll show y'all a few photos. This is Ronald signing his book. We, our book release, we had it at the House of Dance and Feathers in 2009. It took two and a half years to make. And um, it poured down rain. It's just like it's an <laughs> avalanche of rain. <laughs> and Ronald's yeah. museum is very small, but people stayed. I mean, it was just like an avalanche of uh, happiness. And, um, Did you have a lot of people show up? We had uh, hundreds of people show up, and almost everybody f from the books came. Um, and there was a great kind of Mardi Gras Indian practice that happened. Oh, uh, yeah, see the tambourines. In there. Mm -hmm. There's um, Ricky and the Cosmo, Comanche Hunters. Uh, Romeo from the Ninth Ward Hunters. It was a, a pan Mardi Gras Indian celebration. It was one of the things that was important to Ronald was to highlight people from around the city. Mm -hmm. There's little Walter Cook who had a brass band. Um, and that's Victor uh, from Fayaya coming to get his book. Victor's um, part of the book project is Ronald's book project. Um, and I would say kind of the long-term legacy of 
um, my relationship with Ronald is that by, by us doing this kind of deep community-based work or, um, around his museum, the Neighborhood Story Project became known as a place where people felt comfortable sharing their stories because they knew that we would take the extra time to make sure that we had gotten them right. And um, just to go full circle, uh, a couple of years ago, we created a book with um, Sylvester and Victor um, mm -hmm. that was using similar methods to what we used with um, the House of Dance and Feathers. So this is um, some images from that book release. And you're in here too, Bruce. What? Oh, the dead people. Yes, <laughs> yes. I recognize them anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the Fire in the Hole book, mm -hmm. which is uh, yeah, it's a, a wonderful catalog and collective as well. Um, well, yeah. that's uh, yeah, it's it, quite an undertaking to take that many people and uh, somehow stitch them together. Uh, but I mean, the effect of it I know is is wonderful. And, and Ronald, uh, from what you've told me, was a great salesman as well. He was a great bookseller and a, a agent of uh, moving product. So how many editions did you say that? Uh, um, yeah, so reprints <laughs> <laughs> we're in our fourth edition of the book. Um, prior to the House of Dance and Feathers catalog, we had um, created a book with nine times Social and Pleasure Club that was chosen as the citywide reading campaign book. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of books were moving through the city based on that. And Ronald's said to me early on, I'm going to um, beat that. <laughs> I will be your bestseller. And he is our bestseller. Um, we also did some really uh, beautiful collaborations with exhibits. Like in this one is Ronald is coming to get his, the fire in the whole book signed by Victor. Yeah. But then we, d we all worked on an exhibit at the Neighborhood Story Project together called Our Ancestors Eyes, Spirits, Devotion and Carnival in New Orleans and Haiti. Um, and that was just the year before COVID. So we were looking forward to continuing to collaborate together. Um, we saw him on March 8th at the Neighborhood Story Project for a con um, concert that Bruce um, was organizing with Dady St. Pri, a musician from Martinique. Mm -hmm. He sat next to my mom on her birthday uh, and um, Victor was there, it was a full house. It really feels like a different era um and then lj called me a little while later and told me that he was in the hospital so i spoke with minnie and um very very quickly because it was the early days of covid where we really didn't know what was going on she said they're gonna put him in hospice and i said how is that possible you know like they're not, why aren't we like why aren't they giving him a chance he's just he hasn't been sick and on march 20th he passed away quick yeah um this and then we we lost sylvester as well um in september not to covid but to a, a burst appendix and kind of long-term health complications yes and so this is a, a tribute that we did um to him and sylvester and um to kim Boutte, who's the big queen of fayaya mm -hmm for All Saints Day at the back street. And we hope to continue <laughs> to, um, you know, honor Ronald's legacy. Uh, he, we will definitely do some kind of major <laughs> celebration of his life when we're vaccinated and it's safe to be back together in a major way. And the museum will reopen as well. His family wanted to um, let everybody know that when- They've decided this, this, to. Yeah, it's that's, gonna be- that's wonderful to, mm -hmm. to keep the legacy alive. Well, uh, this has really been wonderful. I think I'd like to just play a little bit of music, um, you know, for Ronald and Sylvester and, and Kim and all of those folks who uh, have upheld uh, these uh, longstanding and not easy to erect cultural uh, legacies here in New Orleans and uh, really, you know, in this space around the world. And people always look to New Orleans to try and figure out even how how these things are done. And we've had a wonderful opportunity to uh, 
dive into the trove of the work of uh, Ronald W. Lewis this evening and his connections with so many other people um, in his communities mainly, but also people from around the world, the many students, the uh, news reporters like Steve Inski and uh, you know, people that were coming from all over. Um, so I'm gonna play a little music here, this thing hopefully. Um, because a lot of what they have done is, is just things that, um, you know, it keeps the, the hope and the spirit of, you know, what they had to offer and the land of the living and it, and it goes so much farther beyond that. And it, and it set a pathway and great model for others. And, you know, as they say, uh, you know, to look at it and see it is to understand that, you know, we are walking on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> There ain't no grave can hold my body down, my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down, my body down. Well, when the first old oh, trumpet sound, I'll be getting up and walking round. There ain't no grave can hold my body down, my body down. Well, I've heard of the beautiful city where the streets are paved in gold. And though I have not oh, been to heaven, oh Lord, I've been told. Will that around the throne of grace He's got to pawn my soul a place There ain't no grave can hold my body down My body down there ain't no grave can hold my body down, my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down, my body down. Well, when the first old trumpet sound, Lord, I'll be getting up, shown of walking round. There ain't no grave can hold my body down, my body down. Well, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, well, it made poor Mary moan. Then he looked down on his disciples and said, Now take my mother home. Ain't that a pity, ain't it a shame How they crucified 
Thank you all for joining us this evening here at the um, Cafe Istanbul. Uh, once again, thank you to Charles, Charles, and Chuck uh, for having us here and the uh, CARES Act, um, LEH, NEH. And um, thank you. And if you uh, are, pay attention and check out the next part of this series. This is uh, the first of a four part series, as I understand it. And, um, so, um, I don't know if you have any parting comments that you'd like to uh, um, speak well, about, but. Uh, well, I would like to just say thanks to Jonathan Mayer for the beautiful artwork that y'all are looking at um, and the Land Memory Bank and Seed Exchange for helping us organize that. Um, also, for the last year, um, one of the projects that Sylvester and Ronald and Bruce and I were planning on working on together as an exhibit at the historic New Orleans collection called Dancing in the Streets. That's right. And um, it's dedicated to both of them. There's a beautiful um, part of the exhibit that has parts of their collection in it. And we it's open to the public to 4.30 each, most days. Um, and we welcome everybody to come over and check it out. We used a lot of the methodology that we developed with Ronald in his book to create our part of the exhibit with um, 29 social and pleasure clubs. And um, if you're interested in the House of Dance and Feathers book, uh, you can um, purchase it at the Neighborhood Story Project website, which will go to support the museum still t as well. Um, Charles, did you have any questions or things that you would like us to <laughs> um, well, we have a lot of books. Uh, we have a whole series of books with high school students from John McDonough Senior High. Bruce and I have two books together. One is called Talk That Music Talk, Passing on Brass Band Music in New Orleans, the Traditional Way, as well as Liqueur Creole, which is um, a CD of Bruce's music, if you liked it tonight, <laughs> and um, a, a book that of a collaborative ethnography that I helped create um, about Louisiana Creole where, music. Where can they purchase these books? Like what's the, the dot org dot com? Um, the neighborhood story project dot org would be the the place to get it. You can also get it at local bookstores. Um, you but say that again slow. Sorry, I missed it myself. Um, www dot neighborhood story project dot org is um, the best way to support the organization and our partners like the House of Dance and Feathers or the Backstreet because we're able to profit share when we sell directly. When we don't sell directly, we're not able to do that as well. Um, we uh, are looking forward to um, doing an exhibit at Prospect 5 with a group of women who are involved in healing arts in the city. Um, and Sula Evans with the Temple of Light, Ile de Coin Coin in the Ninth Ward. And um, we have a collection of music coming out that was recorded at the Neighborhood Story Project as part of a series that we do with Preservation Hall and um, the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South. Yes. And it's called La Union Creole. So those are the two things coming up for us, as well as maintaining. Well, you named six, so I don't know if that's true. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> There's a. Past books and upcoming books. <laughs> yes. 
Thanks, Charles. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in and, and hanging with us this evening online on Facebook live uh youtube as well and we thank you and please um check out the next series that's coming up. who's coming up next it's uh, it's um a series it's it's a talk about um, climate change in louisiana climate change in louisiana mm -hmm. now that is what they call tres important i mean you can wait not even 10 minutes and the climate will change on you and the water's coming to the backyard and so you need to know what kind of uh, indicator plants and animals and how you can outrun, outvote, and help think this situation. But thank you all for uh, joining us and being with us this evening. And we hope to see you next time. Y'all uh, stay safe, get your shots, mask up. And like they say around the corner, now why pleat, we'll see y'all later.